So we had quite a few people who were intrigued by the last part of your talk, and so here are a few questions from that. Can you comment on the ether and dark matter and dark energy? <laughs> um, <coughs> ether, <laughs> I see Bill Dembski out there. I'm, <laughs> maybe, see if he can help out. Um, okay, uh, the ether was always a theoretical construct. It was never observable or directly detectable. Uh, with special relativity, the Michelson-Morley experiments, uh, we, fin we finally once and, for, once and for good got rid of it. Um, and um, we do now have unobservable matter that's posited in cosmology called dark matter. Um, and it's um, posited as a way of explaining things that we can see. And I think this is a common thing in, in physics. So there's nothing inherently wrong with positing an unobservable entity to explain something observable. It's just that the ether turned out to not be very good at explaining what we actually see. So physics is often indirectly inferential in that we posit unobservable entities insofar as they help us to explain things that we can observe or measure or detect. Which I think is an interesting point about the God hypothesis in that there's no intrinsic disreputability there's nothing intrinsically disreputable about positing a past action of an intelligent agent or of a designing agent or even of God if in so positing we can provide a more comprehensive and, or parsimonious explanation of the observables. Uh, dark matter is a physics, is, is posited on, on the basis of its ability to help us explain certain phenomena in cosmology. Um, and there's a cosmological model called the oscillating universe that depends upon, um, that, w that has been refuted because there's not enough energy even the, uh, and dark matter, even the dark unobservable matter to cause a recollapse of the universe. Um, and any, anyway, there's a lot more to say about all of that. But yeah, that's a great question. Someone else asked, do you see any relationship between quantum fields and constant spirit action? Uh, well, the modern uh, view of gravity is that gravitons are a manifest, uh, if you go to the, the standard model of particle physics, the idea that el elementary particles are manifestations of underlying fields. And, but fields are oddly defined operationally in terms of what they do. So fields in physics, to me and to other philosophers of physics, uh, not all, but many, have a kind of occult quality. We don't know really what a gravitational field is other than it creates a warping of space. So it's the thing that causes the curvature of space. What is the curvature of space? Well, it's the thing that causes matter to move in a, a, a particular kind of curved trajectory. But what is curved space when space is empty? Um, well, that's a harder question to answer. It's, it's, it's all called in the sense that we define it in relation to what it does, okay? And which, which was the very thing that bothered Leibniz in that seemed to him to be the return to the the proper the, the, the explanatory strategy of the medievals. So physics has never really gotten away from these occult properties. And the particular question was about oh yeah, in quantum field theory, there's a new theory called quantum gravity, which attempts to synthesize general relativity, which is sort of the, the second theory of gravity after Newton's, with fundamental quantum phenomena, because there are points for example, very early after the beginning of the universe, when the universe, when quantum effects would have predominated, so we need to have some account of how gravity would have worked in that domain or that period of time. So there's been this attempt to synthesize, and one of the idea, one of the um, theoretical constructs which produces, out of which comes the notion of gravitons, is the quantum gravitational, the concept of a quantum gravitational field, and. The weird thing about gravitons is that whether they are um, proposed as a result of quantum field theory or as a result of string theory, which was an attempt to shore up some mathematical problems with quantum field theory, gravitons are massless entities which transmit gravitational force, not, at, not instantaneously, but at the speed of light, and they transmit gravitational force by warping space-time. So you have a massless thing that warps a completely massless thing, and that explains how matter moves. It's still occult, that's okay. the... Okay, um, in our last five minutes, I'm gonna try to sandwich in three things, which one of which includes asking about um, 
the, the God of the gaps. But we have someone who asked a uh, question, maybe a little <laughs> bit more technical for some people, but I, we hear this a lot. Uh, methodological naturalism was developed by Christian scientists, so why is methodical, methodological naturalism not the preferred method for Christians today? Um, I dispute the premise of that question. Um, it's a common view and I understand where it comes from. But um, in the Boyle, the mechanical philosophy is the first attempt to formulate where God is an appropriate and not appropriate explanation. And the charge against Newton is that he violated Boyle's rule, which is that we shouldn't be invoking episodic actions of the divinity to explain regular things that we observe as regular processes in nature. And it turns out that Newton didn't do that. It's a common, common story. I have a whole module on it that I knew I wasn't going to get time to do, but maybe next year. Um, it's in the book. It's in chapter 20. I've always <laughs> been suspicious of this story because Newton's whole theological project was to show the principles of mathematics at work in nature. In other words, he, he was reveling in the grand regularities of nature as an expression of divine action. Why would he then invoke God's episodic action? He didn't believe in a capricious God, so why would he be invoking that? It never made sense. And yet you hear this story over and over again. Neil deGrasse Tyson told it in the Cosmos uh, reboot that he did on Fox. Um, it's, it's on the BioLogos website. It's in numerous historians of science. So in researching the book, I just went back and read the relevant parts of the Principia on this. And not only does Newton not make that argument that God or the angels step into, the, the, the claim is that the, the outer planets made the, the uh, you know, Jupiter's orbit was, was irregular and in that the, there was a need to, to t tweak things so that Newton said, well, every once in a while, God just jumps in and, 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 and somehow tweaks the planetary orbits. He did not say that. He said that the planetary orbits that, that were stable on an order of millions of years and that, this, and that everything was stable about the, the, the stable center of the sun. So he did not invoke... It's just, it's in, if you want to, the chapter and verse, it's in the Principia, book 12, um, chapter 12, theorem 12. It's in, and I've got, I've got a slide on it. It's in the book. It's a commonly told story. What Newton did believe was that God was the constant, he was constantly sustaining the universe by the word of his power. That in him, all things are held together. They, they, in him, they have their being and they are moved. So he believed that God, what we call the laws of nature, are a mode of divine action. But he didn't think God was acting willy-nilly to adjust things and fix things that he hadn't gotten right in the first place, which was Leibniz's argument against him. And then secondly, he also made initial condition fine-tuning arguments. He believed that the eye was initially and beautifully designed. To, and he made a, a beautiful design argument in the optics based upon the, the, the fact that the eye seemed to anticipate the properties of light. So he perceived in that a great mind behind the whole system. And in that argument from the general scholium about the, about the initial condition, fine tuning of the planets, that's very similar to the modern kinds of design arguments. But this is not God acting to, in, a, in, in a capricious way to intervene in nature, which was what Boyle was against. So um, anyway, it's, a big, it's a, again a big story, but the, the prohibition against invoking divine action was invoking a particular kind of divine action that would have been a science stopper, that would have kept us from getting to an, uh, an understanding of the causal powers that God had built into nature. And that was the prohibition that came from Boyle. That was not methodological naturalism in its modern form, which says that you can't invoke divine action to explain anything, including the origin of the universe or its fine tuning or the origin of life, which are different classes of question, not classes about the nature of regularities and what underlies them, but rather classes about causal origins, what caused something in the first place. Boyle made those kinds of arguments and affirmed their legitimacy in their own domain. And in my work, I've made a distinction between historical science, which asks questions of ultimate or initial causal origins, versus um, the sciences of the, what, what the Greeks called nomological, the, the, the science of law-like regularities, or experimental science, which is concerned with law-like regularity. So in one category of science, invoking God prevents us from understanding 
the, the material interactions that, are, that underlie certain regularities. In another type of science, it may be absolutely necessary to get a true understanding of what caused things to come into being in the first place. I think that is a great place to wrap up, except we have one comment from someone uh, named Alex I wanted to read as an ending, which is, return of the God hypothesis is the best and easiest to understand overview of science history I have ever read. Meyer does a great job making cosmology concepts easy. So if that's not an endorsement, and we didn't pay for it, and Dr. Meyer didn't know about it, uh, I, I don't know what it is. I was afraid it was gonna be a troll. <laughs> no, no, so what you should, we're gonna break in just a, a moment, but as, as I give the final announcements, Dr. Meyer, you're gonna pick up yourself and go out and get ready to sign books. Okay, very good, thank you uh, very In much. the fellowship hall, so. Thank you.